research into IT. Mr. Adeda always forgets to start the recording until a few minutes. <laughs> We've gone. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Adebi, for joining. We also have Dr. Ebokari. Dr. Ebokari is um, a senior lecturer in communication and language arts, but she also heads our biomedical communication center. And um, the truth is, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking very closely, working with the ITU, the e-learning, and the BCC, and with you, Dr. Owosheni, about getting some programs out from our Biomedical Communication Center, which is both a service and an academic center. And I can see all the others. So we would, I can see your classmates, Mary Ogalahi, who introduced you to us. A copy, she posted some of your work on the UCH um, mailing group. And that was when I was, you know, so excited and said, wow, I must make uh, contact with this lady. And honestly, it's been wonderful. So I know a couple people are joining gradually. So we will just go, maybe go ahead. And um, I don't know if, um, maybe while we, we wait, maybe a couple, one or two, let's say one more minute. I don't know if anyone that has joined would like to say one or two things while people are joining on. Um, Mary, do you have any words for us? You're also an artist. You're always turning out stories every week. So. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just here to learn, ma. I have nothing to say. OK. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mary. And um, I think, well, we, we are 10 minutes into the time. So I will just hand over to Dr. Buki Owosheni um, of the ComUI College of Medicine me, uh, med, Medical graduating class of 2004. And apart from having an MBBS degree, she has an MA in Comparative Literature and Criticism from the University of London. And um, she's been taking us through a series, a creati creativity lecture series. And um, today's session um, is creating a unified story creating a unified story. I know she always gives a little preview and um, it's basically helping us reflect on our curriculum review process. So once again, we welcome you. We appreciate you, Buki, and over to you. Thank you. So over to you, Buki. You need to unmute. Unmute. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm just trying to work out what my screens are doing. Okay. Okay, I hope everyone can see that. Um, I know last yes, week I had some problems with my audio. If, if, if I'm too low, um, just please um, interrupt me, let me know. Um, because sometimes I might not be able to see the chat while I'm... Uh, You're fine, fine. Okay, thank Loud you. and clear, yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you again for another opportunity, Professor Nicola. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Professor Lourdesson, um, for this opportunity to continue to... Um, to go on through this creativity series. I mean, to be honest, well, when uh, Professor Nkodo asked me to come along and support the Biomedical Communications Unit, I, I really did think, you know, what do I have to share? What do I really have to say? And this process of these videos, I'm learning just as well, just as long, uh, just as well as I'm you know, sharing and exploring these ideas. For me, it's also been a process of, you know, exploring creativity and exploring how we can bring that to bear on academic issues, how we can bring that to bear on things that seem unrelated to art. Um, so today, today's, I'm going to talk about creating a unified story. So we've been going on a, along on a bit of a journey. Um, we've gone through, this is our fourth session, we've gone through four sessions. And our first session, we were talking about 
uh, searching for the unified self. In that session, we talked about what the unified self is, and it's basically about you know accepting ourselves and bringing all our abilities and our skills to bear on a task. It's about that refusal to split ourselves into so many different parts, trying to bring out this, all the things in ourselves together. Because when we do so, we are more powerful, we are more forceful in our activities, and we are more purposeful, and we enjoy the things that we do much better. And session two, we talked about, um, about the unified self-living clues. And what we talked about quickly was really about how we cannot split ourselves into too many parts because sometimes the parts that we think are unrelated, part A that's unrelated to part B, can actually give us some clues about things. We talked about how when we're relaxing, when we're in our flow state, we observe things about ourselves that we wouldn't actually understand about ourselves when we're busy and when we're in the work environment. We gather information at the intersection between work and play, between hobbies and work, between, between different um, things that seem separate. We're able to understand more and more about ourselves at this junction where these things meet. And last week we talked about framing our stories and we, we, we discussed this, um, this carving by Lamedi Fake and it was about a warrior on a horseback and we talked about the framing of that carving and we talked about how he broke the frame and how he had to modify the frame for some reason because he couldn't fit that drum in. And we discussed how changing that frame allowed the story to become a different story and making accommodation for that drum. It changed that whole landscape from just a story about a horse being looked after to a story of a triumph, a story of um, someone lauding bravery. It became a glorious and valorous story rather than just a static image. So sometimes when we have a compelling reason, we can actually break the models and mental models that we've given ourselves, break the frames that we've put ourselves into. When our frame is too rigid, we end up leaving very important parts of ourselves outside the story. So, we're, so, so we should be able to break it when we need to. So we talked about six sessions, over six sessions, and this is the fourth of the six sessions. We're going to talk about um, 12 ideas and one method that brings all these ideas together. And these are all the six ideas we've talked about so far. We talked about the idea that creativity is perception. It's not some gift or some talent that's been given to some people while others have been ignored. Um, creativity is just our way of looking at things, and we all look at things differently. And creativity must first be turned inward. We look into ourselves first and we apply our creativity to ourselves. Then we begin to understand what creativity is, how to use it, and then we can apply it outward. And one thing about creativity we can do is within all the seemingly separate parts of ourselves, all our interests, all our hobbies and our passions and our ideas, we, if we look closely enough, we will see a common thread. We will see common things that go throughout all the activities we have. We might say a common thread is, for example, say I'm a patient person. I'm patient on the ward. I'm patient when I'm baking. I'm patient when I'm playing football. I'm patient when I'm dealing with children. I'm pa so we just begin to see common things about ourselves and identifying them helps us in other areas. And idea four is what we see becomes a story. Stories are so important because we're always telling a story. There are, there are no absolutes. We looked at some writing from Chino Achebe where he suggested that, you know, culture, our culture says that, that, that nothing is actually absolute, where there is something and other things stands beside it. There are stories that we tell ourselves for various reasons. Um, so whatever, it's important that we look properly because whatever we see in our mind becomes a story. And ideas five and six, when we talked about framing the story, our story requires context. We need to know what's the whole story before I put a frame around it. Am I sure, is this the correct story? If I say, this is how I am, have I included everything within it? Have I included um, things I enjoy within it? Have I included things I'm good at within it? Have I included things I need to get better at within it? Is this story a complete one? Is it complete enough that I can put a frame around it? So we need context for our stories. And we can break the frames that no longer serve our story. When we have a story and the story is going nowhere and the story does not seem to have a triumphant ending in its place, 
you can choose to break the frame to allow different elements to come in and to allow the elements that no longer serve us to leave. We are able to break the frames of our story, break our mental models, change the ideas we have in order to create something that's um, something that suits us better. So this session is about creating a story and how we create a story. So when we create a story, one of the tools storytellers use to create stories is structure. Um, stories help us um, when we start writing. It's sometimes helpful to use a prompt, um, to use just any tool we can use just to get ourselves moving. Um, creating the framework for a story helps us to understand the different elements, helps us to see what we're looking at, and helps us to create a bit of distance. If we start trying to tell a story chronologically, first I came here, and then I went there, and then I, sometimes when I get our feet tangled, we don't know where we are, are we talking too much, are we talking not enough, are we capturing the whole story? So when we have this structure, we're able to look at core themes, core elements that surround that's around a story. And so we're going to look at what different ways of making up a story. So we look at structure. Um, so there are different structures. I mean, there are traditional structures. Um, there's, you know, it's okay, break up a story, talk about the beginning, introduce it, set it up, talk about the middle, talk about the end. But today what I'm going to talk about is the mythic journey and it's, it's called the hero's journey. And it's more of a, it's a more, it's a complex kind of storytelling, but it's something that's very recognizable, it's very familiar. Um, if you've never heard of the hero's journey, um, as I talk about it, you'll begin to sort of identify with it because we see it all around in the cinema, we see it all around in books, and it's sort of an almost, it's, it's really famous because when we think about it, it's quite intuitive and we see it in a lot of folklore and um, it just helps us to chart where we are on our journey and our path. So the hero's journey. The hero's journey started with Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell was a professor of literature, comparative mythology and comparative um, religion. And he taught for many years and he came out, he wrote many books on ancient customs and folklore. And he wrote a very famous book. This book made him really famous. It's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And what he did in this book was he, he did, um, based on all his years of compar studying comparative mythology, he tried to examine ancient myths and he tried to examine ancient stories, tried, trying to find parallels across it. And he came up with a theme for a story and, and he described it as the hero's journey. Now, many people have modified it over the years, but the basic elements still remain um, recognizable in the sense that there are parallels across myth in different cultures and different, um, different, um, different languages. And he just pulled the things that resonated within several cultures across the world. And he came up with something that's like this. And the many stages, but the main stages of it are um, a separation, a return and an initiation. It seems really complex, but I hope as we go along, we'll be able to recognize parts of it. So why you'll recognize it is because this is basically every American adventure film that has ever been made. They, they, they a lot of them follow this almost as a formula. Um, for a box office success. And there's a reason why they follow this formula because it's familiar, people relate to it. People actually enjoy it and people find this kind of story structure credible. There are three main parts. And the first part is there's a separation and it's about the hero, the hero of the story. There's a, a separation or a departure. The hero must leave, the hero must go somewhere. The adventure never happens at home. The hero has to get up and go somewhere to go and do something. So that's the separation. Then there's the initiation and the hero goes through all sorts of trials and tribulations and meets friends and people that want to trap them. And there's just so much 
perseverance. The hero has to do. The hero gets to a point where they almost fail, but they don't. And then the final stage is the return. And with the hero crossing the final threshold, returns, the hero learns something really, really important. And the hero returns back to this place where they started from. But they are not the same person. The hero has grown in wisdom, has grown in understanding. And that is basically Joseph Campbell's the hero, um, the hero's journey. So we're, I'm going to play a video of place now. Um, and it just kind of it just summarizes this, uh, this journey. This is the Hollywood guidebook for heroes. You will learn the secret truth behind most blockbuster movies. They basically all follow the same 12 steps, also known as the hero's journey. Every hero's story starts off with some sort of nobody living in an ordinary world. But by following the white rabbit, he will get a call to adventure. At first, you can't be too eager. You must refuse the call. By running away from his destiny, he will stumble upon a mysterious old guy who will turn out to be his mentor. Now he's ready to cross the threshold. Where he's going, he doesn't need runs. Of course, he will be tested, and he might need to win the game to gain new allies and enemies. He must overcome his fear by entering the inmost cave. Here, he will face his supreme ordeal, which will change his life forever. After defeating some bad guy, he'll receive his well-deserved reward. And because he can, he will be flying the road back. But before realizing there's no place like home, our apprentice must resurrect as a new person. Eventually, our hero will return to where he started, but things will never be the same again. This is what we call the hero's journey. So that's basically just an animation, just summarizing the hero's journey. And if 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 you like your films, you might have seen some of the um some familiar movies in there. You'll see you know, Lord of the Rings, you see Batman, you see Matrix, you see almost so many popular movies, movie lines have that. If you have um, uh, yeah, The Matrix, Jaws, The Sound of Music, um, Rambo, they follow this storyline. And the reason they follow it is that it just, it works. It has a recognizable formula. And that formula actually is very helpful for us when we are looking at our own journey. So, Christopher Vogler somewhat simplified it. I mean, he simplified it for, particularly for the screen, just for, um, for, for, for working, on, working on television. And he helped the screenwriters to simplify it. And that is what it kind of looks like. It, it starts with a call to adventure, then it goes on to meeting a mentor in the normal world. Um, then there's a crossing of a threshold, trials and failure, there's growth and skills, and there's a death and a rebirth. There's a revelation and some new understanding. The hero finally changes. Then there is an atonement because the hero would have made a mistake at some point. Uh, the hero gets some gifts and the hero returns changed and starts again back in the normal world. And when we look at ourselves and look at sort of any journey that we've been on, we can actually see this pattern. I mean, it's the same thing as going to, going to university, okay, off to the College of Medicine. It's a call to adventure, you meet a mentor, that you need that mentor in order to cross that first threshold because you've left the normal world, you're now in an unknown world. You cross the threshold, there are trials, there are failures along the way, you make friends, you make you need allies that help you through the jet, through, through the strange world, you have the enemies. You know, it's just like any film, like, you know, Lord of the Rings, someone helps you, you learn new skills, and at some point there is a death of something, and there is a rebirth of something, something of the old ways, the old ways you behaved at home, things you didn't understand, some sort of new maturity comes forth, so there's a death, but with that death, there's also a rebirth of something else, an understanding, 
when you finish, you go back to the same home you came from, so, but the, you are definitely not the same person. So you return changed. But there are many things that we can recognize on, on, this, on, on, this, on this journey. And we look at all these spots and we say, everything here is so important. Now, it seems like, is it, is it just for a movie? But the reason we like it in the movie is because we understand it instinctively. We understand that to cross a threshold from an old comfortable world to a new comfortable world, we need to meet the, you know, every film has, you know, Gandalf has the wise man who, who gives you the word, has the, you know, the sensei or the J Japanese master. There has to be that meeting of the mentor or else the hero cannot cross that threshold. Um, um, we, we, we know that there will be failures, the, the purpose of the, the failure sometimes is to tempt the hero to go back to the normal world. We know this, we, we all experience this. We have helpers, we have people who help us in our times of vulnerability. We look back and we know that, you know, without them, they, they, they at some, part, some dark points in our lives, we couldn't have gone forward. So we see that, we know that that is vital because therefore we can reject this whole idea of you know, the self-made woman, the self-made man, because we know that on the hero's journey, there's a mentor, there's a helper. And then we know that we, we learn our new skills. Then we know that at some point we say, who I am is not really working for this place. I can't wake up at 10 a.m. and you know, still survive in this new academic environment. There's a death of so many of the things that I used to be, but, be repl but replaced, it's replaced with something else then there becomes this wisdom that comes forth and everybody goes through this because everybody goes through an experience, comes out, they are wiser, they're able to tell other people, no, it's not like that, don't worry about it, because they begin to have this deep understanding that only experience can bring. And then there is a change, deep-seated change, there is atonement. And we find in every film, there's always this mistake that the hero makes, something goes wrong, the hero makes a mistake. And and I think that's critical to the hero's journey. And um, um, so many films, either they're, they're almost tempted or they, or they accidentally betray a friend or something happens. And we identify with it and we forgive our hero because we know that mm -hmm. it's almost, it's impossible for, for, for us to have a hero without that. Nobody wants a perfect hero. Nobody watches a film where the hero has, you know, fantastic teeth, is very handsome, gets everything perfectly done, has absolutely no weaknesses and no failures. We always want a hero with a flaw. The reason we do that is because that is how we are. The things we, the things that settle us when we, when we, when we read a book, the things that settle us when we look at art, the things that settle us when we watch a film, sort of give us clues to how we feel life should be, how we feel life is. And life has no perfect heroes, so we, we refuse perfect heroes in cinemas. We like our heroes with weaknesses because they remind us of ourselves. And then we see that the hero gets some sort of gift. Something comes from the outside. Help comes from the outside. Our hero never, ever, ever has all the resources with him. At the last minute, somebody comes with the car that the hero jumps on to escape. Something comes from without. And we sense that in the natural world. We sense that you know, we can have everything put together, we can be as intelligent as we like, but we know that at some point, help comes from somewhere. So we, that's why we stay open, that's why we stay resourceful, that's why we open ourselves up to opportunities, because we know that things that we don't expect often come. And then the hero returns back home, changed. Now this works because we are familiar with this. Now, where are you in this journey? And what's the whole point of this in the journey? Now, the point of this hero, why we can use this um, hero's journey for something or curriculum or for ourselves personally, is it helps us to sketch out a narrative for where we are. So for example, this hero's chart can be used as widely as we like to describe a life I can look at my whole life and I can see, okay, right now, where am I? Um, am I? Am I in a normal world? Am I comfortable? Am I out of my comfort zone? You know, at this time of my life, where am I? Or I can just look at it on a very small level and I can say, I'm learning a new skill. Where am I on this new skill that I'm learning? And then you can actually realize that once you plot yourself on this chart, 
you can create a vision for where the rest of the story should be. So for example, if I'm learning piano and I hate piano and I'm ready to give up piano, even though, you know, all my, you know, I've wanted for so many years to practice, but it's come time to then it's just not working. If I really want to craft a vision and I say, actually, no, I really, really, really want to learn this piano. I don't want to give it up. I want to create a story that I can tell. You know, I, I have this frame that says, I don't play piano. I have this frame that says, oh, I'm not really musical. And I really want to break that frame. I can tell a story, a visionary story. I can envision a story using this tool to see where I want to be. So if I'm struggling with this piano, I can begin to see that I'm at the trials and the failure level. That is where I am. And if I know that that's where I am on the hero's journey, I can create the rest because these are tools to tell me exactly what I need to do. Have I met my mentor? Okay, am I crossing the threshold? What's the threshold? The threshold is probably buying a piano. Or have I crossed my mentor? Have I met a mentor crossing, I'm crossing the threshold? Um, the mentor, maybe, I, maybe I'm just learning from videos and nobody has ever really showed me how to place my hands and my fingers. But the story is not complete just because I have the trials and the failure because we know this because every story that we know and every story we love, most of them follow this. But when, when the trials and failures, that is not the end of the story, that is just a part of the story, the new skills are afterwards. So I then begin to think about, okay, um, the new skills, and then if I, if, I, if I continue with this, on this journey, in this uncomfortable, unknown world, at some point, I will return home. There will be some growth of new skills, there will be the death of the idea that I no longer play piano, I'll have some rebirth, a revelation. I don't know what the revelation will be. The revelation might be, this is how I need to hold my fingers. I shouldn't hold my fingers like that. I hold my fingers this way. There is some sort of change. There is help from the outside. Then I begin to say, oh, I need to look for help from the outside because the hero does not learn to play piano on their own. So it's this story that I can apply to so many things. If I, if, you know, when people say, do you have a goal for your life? Do you have a vision for this? And, you know, you look at them quite blankly. I don't know. But one idea might be to use a hero's journey to start and say, this is where I am and this is where I want to be. I want to return. I'm happy where I am, but I want to be here changed. So I need to go through this whole cycle. I can actually craft out this story that gets you to where you want to be. And the reason why this is useful is because it creates a unified story. It creates a story that's not just one-sided. Now, this story has all the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. So sometimes we like to create our visions of the things we want, and um, we want the story to be wonderful, and I want to have this and have that and success, and, and it's great, but it doesn't give us the tools for the, for the um, discomfort that will come. And that's why this is a very useful tool. So they talk about archetypes and archetypes, basically they're sort of figureheads, like the hero is an archetype. It's just, a, it's sort of a, a substitute it's for a trope, it's describing a kind of person. So there's so many archetypes, um, the hero in the story is an archetype, the friends in the story are an archetype, the mentor is an archetype. They just have all these placeholders for people. So you begin to understand that actually I can slot things into here. I can mm -hmm. slot a mentor in, I can slot an ally here. Um, these are the things I can put into the story. So the story goes, so this, this is the same hero's journey. It's just plotted a bit differently. So we have the ordinary world and all the things that happen in there, and then the special world, and then a return to the ordinary world. So, so we have, um, and, and, and why it's satisfying is when we see it, it's complete. So I'm not sure, let's see, um, if I say any Jaws, for example, I don't know if ever, not many, I don't know, not around I've watched Jaws or Lord of the Rings. Well, I'll just use Jaws as an example. Jaws is the story of the, of the, um, the shark that they went out to hunt and kill, I think, it's in the 1980s. So it starts with, you know, the shark, the shark's in water, starts on water, starts with the hero of the story, who's the guy with the boat who knows how to look for sharks. And, He's minding his business and then there's a call to adventure. Something happens, there's a shark that's killing people and he needs to go out there. He has allies along the way, goes out to the special world. The special world is the ocean, it's not his. He has to meet his fears. He has people relying on him. He has, um, he has um, um, people helping him as well. 
and there are trials and there are tribulations, you know, there, there, there are failures as he goes along. And, you know, the story, fin he, he, he does get the shark, the story finishes, you know, he comes back, he saved, you know, he saved everyone. And it went through act one, act two, and act three. Back. So it's a complete story. So we saw that this story went the whole circle. We see that with, you know, Rocky as well, and Sylvester Stallone, you know, the boxer, he comes out, call to adventure, they challenge him to a fight, he needs the mentor, he loses, he learns about himself, he learns, you know, how to fight, learns to be better, comes back, is like a resurrection from a career that's, you know, they destroyed his career, he comes back, he's back to the same Brooklyn where he was, but he's changed. And those films were very satisfying because they finished. It was a story that was complete. The circle was complete. They started out and, and they, they began and they went through the whole process. So when the story is uninterrupted, when the story is complete, then we are satisfied. And that gives us clues about what we like. When we're satisfied with that kind of film, then we say, oh, actually instinctively, this completion of this story, this success, the eventual success of the hero satisfies me. So we, we can also look in our local folklore, we can look at Shongo as um, the archetypal hero as well. Um, I don't know if we know the story of Shongo. Uh, Shongo was, um, was, um, was a brother of the king and he was living, he had actually been exiled, not exiled, but he lived in Lupe land. Um, after the death of his father and his brother was king and he was called because his brother was kidnapped by another king and held for a ransom and tribute it's a political storm and he was called to adventure they went to him and they said come so he came and he was able to secure the release of his brother and he left and he was called to adventure again and he was asked to become a last boy or when his brother was deposed he didn't want to so Eventually he came and then he began to cross the threshold. There were mentors in the form of his father, um, his mother's father, who was a, a king in their own place. He became a magician. He had trials, he had failures. He had, to, he had to come to replace a failing king. So he was put on the spot straight away. He had trials, he had his failure. He had domestic issues. He had to find helpers among the chiefs, you know, you um, then he also had his um, new skills, things he needed to learn. He had his horrible temper, which he had to make atonement for. And he eventually changed. His was a death, a dying, a physical dying. And he was, and was there was a rebirth because as the as the story has it, nobody really knows, you know, what happened to Shongo. So people say, you know, he, he hanged himself, he was killed, so people say he didn't die, and he went, you know, and he ascended. So the physical Shongo changed and was reborn as this, as this, you know, deity, divinity, and and the return changed, and the story kind of ended. It was it was a you know a very strong warrior type hero. And the story went the full cycle. Now we have some stories that did not go the full cycle, and we can see that the there is dissatisfaction when a story is incomplete. So an example of an interrupted story: this things fall apart. So things fall apart by Chinua uh, is, is a story basically about Okonkwo, you know, and Okonkwo is the arch hero. Okonkwo is the hero in a hero's journey because Okonkwo is the reason Okonkwo people, so many people love things fall apart and identify with because Okonkwo is a thorough character, a thorough hero that people could identify with. How do you identify with a character? Uh, the character has these characteristics of the hero's journey. They're called to adventure. They have their flaws. They go through these trials and we see their humanity. We see their frailty and we recognize ourselves in their frailty. So we really want them to win because subconsciously we're hoping we win as well. So, but when we have someone like Okoko comes in, I'm not going, and he starts, I'm not going to be weak like my father. He comes in, he has this call, they, you know, the elders, they have this opportunity. Okay, raise the came from now, sit with us. Let's talk about this, these, um, you know, village issues. He was a very respected man called forward to come and, you know, participate in, in life. He made, you know, cross that threshold, made mistakes, had trials, 
accidentally you know, killed someone, had to go back to his mother's people. He had all these trials and he had wise people advising him along the way. His mother's uncle was, was a wise man. His friend, Obirika, was a wise person. And he had so much help along the way, had all these trials, but Okonkwo got to the point where he was in conflict with the white man. And it was a battle that he, he could not win. He was not going to win. And I hope, not a spoiler for anyone who hasn't read Things Fall Apart, um, but in the end, he committed suicide. He ended that story incomplete. There was no return for Okoko. And that suggests that an interrupted story is actually, it's a tragedy. And the tragedy of Okoko is the potential that Okonkwo had to complete that whole cycle because we counted on him. He was the street belt. Okonkwo was the strongest. If, if Okonkwo fails, you know, what, what hope is there for us? So we really, really had a lot riding on Okonkwo's success, but he killed himself. He could because he saw a battle that he wasn't going to win and he left. So there was no rescue from without for Okonkwo. There was no crossing the return threshold. There was no, did Okonkwo really change? There wasn't really much of this opportunity to return as this changed person. There was no longer this opportunity where he would say, I have been to the world at home and I've been to the unknown world and now I'm master of both worlds. He didn't have that. So an uninterrupted, an interrupted story actually ends up being tragedy. So I spent a lot of time talking about stories and the question is why do these stories really matter? And if they matter, you know, why? Why do these stories matter? Talking about films and Jaws and Lord of the Rings and you know, people spend a lot of money on these, on these stories and, and they touch our hearts in so many ways. And, and the question we ask is why do these storybook matters? Why the literature, why the reading, why art? And the reason why they matter is because we matter. They matter because we identify with them. We identify with the heroes we read about. We identify with, you know, the, the films we watch. That's why we watch them. We watch the ones we like. We like them because we identify with them. That is why we cry even when we know it is not real. That is when we cheer even though we know it is not real. We sleep well after their triumph. We watch a really good film where the hero is, you know, I don't know the film, I, guess, I would guess a film like maybe Troy or something, where the hero is buffeted back and forth and things seem not to happen and somehow there is glory at the end and things, things work for the hero and then we sleep better after that triumph. We don't sleep well after the interrupted stories. We sleep well after the complete story. So these storybook heroes give us a clue to see what we expect from a story. And why do we need these clues? A major purpose of art is art is a mirror. Literature is a mirror. Art is a mirror. Cinema is a mirror. We can use them as a clue to see what we like, what we are like. Art creates distance. It's very hard to look in a mirror, you know, with full glare, with the full lights on you. A full mirror is very harsh. And when you know you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, the mirror is very, very unkind. A mirror is not as kind as, you know, maybe an iPhone camera. A mirror will, it's, it's a bit sharp. Sometimes the light falls on the edges a bit too harshly tells us things that we don't really want to know. We're not prepared to know. We're not ready to know. Even if we know, what can we do about these things that the mirror is showing us? So art serves as a gentler mirror. It creates distance. So instead of seeing ourselves, we can begin to see these heroes, diagnose them as it were, and then apply the diagnosis to ourselves. So it creates distance for which we can look at ourselves indirectly. We use them as clues. So some people, two people might watch one film, one person will say, I am dissatisfied with this happy ending. This is a very unrealistic story. And that's a clue for that person and that person's expectations and what that person thinks real life is all about. 
And some people, you know, it's all about the happy ending. You know, the, there is the, the, there's a particular type of ending that they must insist on seeing. For them, you know, that's a clue. There's something you're trying to look at. There's something you prefer. It's a clue to your preferences, to your ideas, to the idea of what that circle looks like, what that journey looks like. And that hero's journey is not the same for all of us. The signposts on each of those parts are very different. They're very different um, based on who we are, what we like, and what our preferences are. So that's why it's a very useful tool because it can be tailored to each individual. So it takes me on to the two ideas that I'm going to talk about for this session. And the two ideas are, the first one is that the hero of the story has a mentor to help cross the threshold. Now there are many stages of, um, of the hero's journey, but I wanted to look at just a few. There are many things we can talk about here, but I think in, in terms of looking at our curriculum, looking at um, the things that bring us together here is you know, the academic study, the College of Medicine. You know, I was looking at what here is actually quite relevant to the story. And I think one of the most important things before the adventure even gets anywhere is the meeting of the mentor. And um, I was reading about, um, about oh, I can't remember the name now, but I was reading about um, someone on the College of Medicine Facebook page. Really, really fantastic, really fantastic work, work I think, in um, genomics, and but still having the time to mentor. And I just thought that was absolutely amazing because that is invaluable. That's invaluable work, that mentorship work, because that is what we require to start from the normal world to head off into the unknown. So many people have been, I mean, even not, maybe sometimes not even just a physical mentor, you know, so I didn't do this until I read this book. I didn't know that was possible until I, 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 I read that book. A lot of times when there is an adventure that we need to go out on, we're not able to go, it's the knowledge. It's the, and, and the mentor brings that knowledge gap, you know, to uh, uh, narrows that knowledge gap for us and helps us to cross that first threshold, they kind of show us the way. I think in Lord of the Rings, it was, uh, it was, it was um, you know, the, the hobbits, and it was Gandalf, the big wizard, and the wizard that said, this is, you know, this is where you go, this is where you're going to meet me, these are the things you're going to meet on the way. But, you know, just keep going, and this is where you're going to meet me. And a lot of stories start out like that, but the, the, the mentor is the first person to say, go, set out. And the confidence that the mentor has in the hero is actually, what the hero needs just to keep going at the very beginning. Towards the end, they begin to ride in their own steam, but at the very beginning, there's somebody from outside who encourages that hero to begin the journey. So the, a unified story needs a mentor to cross that first threshold. And a second idea is that a complete story cycle is satisfying. Now, why did I pick that? I picked that because it's the ending of the story, it's the ending of the movie that tells us how we feel about it. You know, someone says, well, you know, most films are, how did you feel about that film? Really, it's, it's until it's over. We don't know until, until the film you know, ends. And when we're creating our own personal story, personal vision, or vision, vision for you know faculty, a vision for a curriculum, or a vision for a, a vision for a particular group of students, it's it's the, it's, the, it's the ending that satisfies, and we can actually craft the ending without knowing it. We can craft the ending, saying, okay, the ending is actually the beginning. The ending is that they'll be here in this space, but they'll be changed, they'll be transformed, and this is what we want them to be like. And we know these are the stages; they're all going to pass through. Um, and this is where the help comes at every stage. So we identify the stages where, where there are trials, we identify the stages uh, where there is giving up, and then we say these are the remedies we put in place because we know that this is where the story is going to be complete. We don't want the story or corporate war story that sort of stops at the end because they feel there is no way to go further. We find that there are actually ways, there are actually ways of thinking there are other things that can be done that can bring the story to complete cycle. So that story, that complete story is satisfying. So when we say how, like last week, one of the questions was how do we choose what the frame is like? 
one? Is the story is the story a complete one? Is the story a satisfying one? Have we put in all the things into that frame that will bring us to the ending that we want? And that's when you know that, yes, you can now put a frame around it because that story is complete, that story is unified, unified in the sense that it has the highs as well as anticipation of the lows, unified because it's a story of personal strength and resilience, but at the same time recognizing that the hero never ever finishes the journey alone. There is always help from the outside. So these things make it a unified story, make it a true wholehearted story, and hopefully giving us a satisfying ending that we want to share. So the hallmark across everything is to pay attention and pay attention, pay attention in this, in this instance, pay attention to what? So we pay attention to our story. What is our story? You know, do I have a vision of a finished story? Does the curriculum have a vision of a finished story? Does it anticipate the lows in the story? Um, and is my story one-sided or is it unified? The, the one-sided story is I want to earn X amount of money by X number of months. And it's a great goal and it's a great vision. And it's a very one-sided story. The unified story has you know, more of the stages, more of the ups and the downs. It has a, it's, it's more of a, a full story that we can resonate with. So it's, a, it's a journey of a hero. So we pay attention to that and it helps us to write our stories. So in summary, we create, we talked about the mythic storytelling structure as a tool for creating a personal vision. Um, two ideas that we took from it was mentorship and the idea of completing that story to go through the full cycle. And the way we can do that is to pay attention. We pay attention to all the steps. We can pay attention to the steps, pay attention to our personal stories, pay attention to where we are on that cycle. And it's a great tool. I mean, if you just have that page of, um, of the hero's journey and you just put bullet points by each stage, you'll be able to craft a vision statement that um, we're actually having to think with a blank piece of paper. You'd have taken so long to come up with a vision. So it's a really useful tool for creating a vision statement. And that's what we're gonna do um, in session five. It's, it's how to, using a unified story to create something that becomes a vision statement. So it can become you know, a personal vision statement. It can become a vision statement for something in the moment for overcoming the hurdle of not being able to be frustrated with learning the piano. You just write out those bullet points across all those hurdles. You can see where you're coming from in the story. You can see where you're ending. You can see where the hero is supposed to end. And you sort of have an idea of where you are. And it gives courage to, to keep going forward. Then the next time we'll talk about using this to become a vision statement. So thank you very much. Um, any questions or comments? Let me know. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Uwosheni, um, for this um, excellent um, session we have had on um, framing our stories. Um, for those who joined a bit late, Dr. Buki Uwosheni is a uh, um, the College of Medicine MBBS Medical Graduating Class of 2004. And um, she has been, this is the fourth session we are having with her. We've been having excellent sessions with her. Um, she um, has, uh, apart from being a medical doctor, she has a master's, an MA in comparative literature and criticism from the University of London. And um, She's really given us the opportunity to think through a lot of issues. She has six sessions, 12 ideas, one method. And um, I invite you all to put your um, questions in the, um, the chat box, or you could put up your hands. I'll just give a few comments. As she was going through this, you know, so many thoughts came to my mind. And I think um, the hero story is so soothing. And um, two things I was thinking, how does this apply to the curriculum and how the review and how does this apply to our counseling service and providing support for students who would need this through their um, years uh, of, of learning here. I also looked at myself personally and I see myself going through a, 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 a sorry, a cycle. I mean, I went through a cycle in medical school. I've gone through several cycles, 
But since I became the provost of the College of Medicine, I started a new cycle and I have a story, <laughs> very interesting stories. And um, I'm very great, I mean, the issues of separation, return, initiation. And honestly, I can see that you need mentors, you need helpers, you need to cross the threshold. There are trials, there are failures, and then at the end of it all, growth and new skills, the death, rebirth, all these are so important, so important. And it's, it's so real because this is the journey that everyone goes through. But you find that many times because of social media, people see the perfect stories. They see only the perfect stories on Facebook, not knowing that every other person is going through the hero story with the ups and downs, the mountains, the valleys, the crooked places. And, and it's something that we need to really address. And I was thinking that the issue of mentorship is so important in the College of Medicine. Um, but then how, I know some of the, the, like the, the, some of the faculties have like mentorship programs, but then mentors, do you give people mentors? I have a lot of mentees, but it was, it, it came as a natural process. So, but they certainly need mentors. That's the thing, one thing I'm thinking about. Do we allow them to, you know, find their mentors or their mentors to find them? Because it, it's, it's so important. You don't want to place somebody with uh, uh, that, somebody that doesn't match. I mean, I look at all my mentees and many of them have grown and they're, you know, big international people in their own right. But I, I am, we, we found each other in the course of learning. So how do you separate the mentorship, a mentorship program from, because I think it's very important to have this as part of the things that would be around that curriculum. Because knowing that the curriculum needs, um, people need support. And then, and then differentiating them from like helpers. Helpers will be like staff advisors, you know, because mentorship, <clears throat> excuse me, is very deep and intense. It's just, it's not, you know, it, it's, there needs to be, there needs to be ma a match. It may not be even in academics. It may be maybe in um, a, a, a hobby that you both share or something or a way of life that you both think. So mentorship is absolutely essential, particularly with the kinds of things. Another aspect I was thinking in the curriculum is that, is there an aspect in our curriculum where we can actually take them through the story you know, as a cause so that when they start, when they start in 100 level, they know everything about, not, well, not, they can't know everything, but we take them through the whole cause as a story and take them, say, so that they can have an idea of this is where I'm starting from and this is where I'm finishing from. Bring them to the end. Let them have the, the cycle as a cause. Let them know what the electives are, what the options are. Let them know that if you don't, like for example, if you don't pass this exam, you know you no longer have to leave um, school, but you can move into another subject. And so if, if you, you know, if you fail three times, when they come in, do they have that information? Do they have the story as part of the curriculum? I think that is very, very important. And like you said, bring them and then let them know what help is available. Okay, if you are stuck, this is the person that's, ex and so on. Kind of drawing a story, I think it's so important. And of course, like you said, for next week, we'll be looking at the vision of a finished story. But I just, I'm so, um, this is so exciting for me, really having to think through, not only personally, but also how to do things better and to develop things. So I would, I've said my comments, I know you will comment later. Let's see if we have any others in the chat box so that um, there are a couple of comments. There's, um, okay, a comment from, well, Modukwe um, Oluwa uh, to everyone. I learned a lot about the complete cycle of a story, especially being a children's author and not novelist myself. Thank you for that. And then Dr. Dole says, thank you, Dr. Wish, an excellent presentation as expected. The story cycle is eye-opening in life's journey. I really hope we can, we can all really present the true and real cycles 
of our stories. And then uh, Mary, again, Dr. Mary says, no one wants, yeah, that's true. It's important that for people to know, because there's so much focus on perfectionism, how you should be the best, the best to come, you know, and then you see many times, particularly in medical school, you have two people who have already been the best. They come in as the best. They've been the best in primary school, the best in secondary school. And then they come and then they are meeting other bests. And then many of them drop down to, you know, they're no longer the best. Is that the end? Is that a tragedy that would lead to, okay, let me just drop out, you know, a kind of a different kind of suicide, you know? So those are some of the issues. So talking about being open, not wanting an eye opener, but let's see if we have any hands up. Do we have any comments for um, Dr. Owosheni at who has taken us through um, this um, cycle? Very interesting story cycle. I never really looked at it from this pers I mean, perspective about everybody. There's a certain plot, you know, you must go this way. And um, comments, hands up, anyone uh, who would like to comment? Or else I, I can see a couple of people online and I may call you. Okay, Dr. Femi Akindo Sotu of the Department of Anatomy has her hand up. Over to you, Dr. Femi Akindo Sotu. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ma. Uh, thank you for this uh, series of lecture. I, I, I have to confess this afternoon. This is my first time of joining. I tried to join over the past few ones, but I kept on missing it. Maybe I had lectures on meeting. And today I've learned a lot. And like you rightly said, Ma, one thing I've noticed about the medical student is that we, we gather the best from the whole country. The best of the best come to the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan. And then when they take their first MB, when some of them fail, the failure brings them down, they, they, they are broken down. And for them to come back and take the, the, the courses again, it, it, we, I noticed that they don't really do well because they are coming from an aspect where they've always been the best and they could not accommodate and, and think of themselves being failures or failing um a course and then had to repeat so i'm thinking that maybe something can be put in the uh, curriculum as we are planning on reviewing it where they teach the medical student that there will be ups and downs just as uh, buki said that there will be ups and downs and that there will be failure there could be failure and they should they, they should be prepared as a hero to be that there will be ups and downs and that will make them to be prepared and don't expect always to make the journey the journey won't be always a smooth ride thank you very much ma thank you very much uh, dr akin losoto for that but i think so very important um pre preparing them for the journey is so key Absolutely, very, very important. Yes, uh, I the doctor, I wish any will comment, but let me see if there are any other comments, any other comments from the, from the, um, I just want to uh, welcome to this group, uh, um, one of our past provosts, Professor Mikbodu, you are welcome to this, um, nice you are joining today. I don't know if you have any comments or we should, I should just pass over. Thank you so much. I can see any comments, so um, give you time to think through. I can also see one of our newest professors um, and here, um, Professor Bolu Tife Olusonya, the a professor of ophthalmology, of pediatric ophthalmology. Thank you so much. I don't know if you have any comments. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, also Dr. Olubukola Omobowale of community medicine. And then one of the people you met, okay, I can't see him anymore. That was Rufus Akiem. <clears throat> I think he has left. So any other comments, any comments from, Okay, I think Professor Mikbodu wants to comment. He has unmuted himself. Over to you, sir. No, well, just a very brief comment that it's really interesting. The quantum of talent we have in the medical profession and how it manifests in so many different ways. I mean, I was thrilled just listening to um, the exposition with the next, with, had an opportunity of participating in this afternoon. I'm not much of a literature person, but it, it always fascinates me when I see this kind, um, this kind of exploration. And I just want to congratulate um, our main speaker, 
for such a wonderful session. I missed the earlier ones, but this has been an eye opener. And um, I wish you all the best going forward. Bye. Thank you very much, Professor Migbodo. There's Dr. Olushola Olawonye, Dr. Doctor, PhD, PhD. <laughs> Is that you? Let's yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma. Okay. And thank you for this opportunity, ma. Thank you, Buki, for your brilliant presentation. Um, I want you to also um, mention, or at least take us through what you think the life of the doctor will be beyond medical school. Would it also be important, Ma, for us to give them a glimpse of what they have signed up to? Uh, what, what will they do after medical school, for instance? What are the opportunities? What are the, what are the other aspects of being a medical doctor? So much has changed over the years now. And so many more people are going into different fields, uh, even in medicine and outside of medicine. So to complete the story, it would also be nice to have a glimpse into what life could be after medical school. Thank you, Ma. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Olawonye, and congratulations on your two recent PhD um, degrees. It's real, it's true, but you know, yes, beyond medical school, is that a new story? Uh, I will let Buki answer that, or is it a continuation of the story. I mean, Buki has ended up in comparative literature. I mean, well, she's still using her medical skills, but now the it's so the the system the system is so wide, and you you know we have doctors who have gone into fashion design, doctors who have gone into data science, into engineering. It's like many, and then the other thing is that many people came into medicine, not really knowing what the story was about. And at the end of it all, they discover that this is not a story for me. <laughs> I want another story. And then they move out. So those are some of the things, it's particularly because of the system here with Nigeria. If you're a little brilliant, you must go and do medicine. So we have a lot of people who come in and then they, they I have people coming to say, I, I just hate, I, I can't stand this. So I think it's something that we need to think through. You're absolutely right. The story behind um, after, what, what, what happens after? But let's let's let you respond and then we'll continue again next week because of our time. Thank you. Over to you, Buki. Okay, thank you for all the questions and the comments. I appreciate them. Um, I'll start with the end, the, the, the life of the doctor beyond medical school. Um, and whether that's a new story or a current story, and I would say it's both. So the stories are complex and they are um they are um how would I put it? I would say so if if life was a chapter, for example, all these stories are phrases. All the stories are sentences, all the stories are paragraphs. Sometimes you can have a sentence that can stand on its own. You can have, or you can have a part of the phrase that has no meaning unless it's sort of linked with something else. So some things can stand alone and independently and can say, okay, this is a story of an article life. And sometimes there's some stories that just weave into other stories. And I think the beginning of showing that there's life after medical school is to show that there is life in medical school. It is to show, is to encourage that continu continuity of being a unified person, of being a well-rounded person, of being a person who is able to accommodate diverse and multiple um, interests while in medical school. Because the reason of this, of, 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 the, of the problem with, with different interests after medical school is because these interests died in medical school. They, they, they mm. had to die. And that was the myth that was told to me just to do nothing but stare at a book for six hours non-stop, which is not tough to do for anyone. Stare at this book for six hours non-stop and make sure you feel guilty whenever you do any other thing. Make sure you feel guilty when you're relaxing your brain. Make sure you feel guilty when you're utilizing your other talents, when you're refreshing yourself through creative play in order to come back to medicine refreshed. So when we begin to, when we destigmatize that whole idea, when we continue to encourage um, other kinds of expression as and, and treat those other forms of expression as very very important to the profession itself then we begin to have a different view because somebody who is doing fashion design and is practicing medicine has a different insight has different views to just treating humanity 
how just you just notice in their interaction people somebody who maybe is an entrepreneur and a business at the same time you know practicing they have a different way of interacting with people. They have a different idea of efficiency. They might be a bit more efficient. They might be a bit more mindful of waste, financial waste. Why are we doing things this way? Why are we doing this that way? This is not pretty. They bring so much in. So when we when we encourage it in medical school, then that's where we begin, where people begin to have the vision of the things that they can do outside medical school. And you see, you know, you see it just it quite well. There's a lot of extracurricular on offer. There's so much creativity, so much arts. Um, there's so much, there's entrepreneurship in there, lots of people doing so many things. And because it's the whole faculty, because it's the whole you know, college of medicine, there's that connection with other, other, um, other departments, other faculties. So there's a lot going on. So the more we continue to foster that kind of understanding that all of this is part of who you are, you know, then they might, so, so we get rid of that whole, it's either fashion or medicine. We are becoming hybrid people. So exploring that in medical school can help somebody to ha help practice keeping these things together even after they've left. Um, then an earlier question was, how does this apply to the curriculum review? The curriculum review, it's, it's, it's actually a story. So looking at the College of Medicine, the vision, it's the vision that's, you know, the acronym are together. Like so many of these things relate to a story. You know, there's, there's talk about dialogue, there's conversation. There's things about the mentorship, you know, harnessing, uh, harnessing uh, the, um, our, our alumni. You know, bringing in mentors, having this conversation, this continual dialogue, a lot of it you will tell, it's actually story, story like it's building this narrative and building this idea of, um, of, of, of what we want the college to look like, it's an envisioning of a future state. Now with the curriculum review, sometimes you look at things as a very, you know, very um, uh, academic or administrative process, because for a college, yes, we'll, we'll put together a vision and we'll take the time to make a statement. But sometimes for a curriculum review, do we put together a vision, first of all, and say, okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm revising my anatomy past question papers. I want to just read some things out that don't relate to knowledge. So we just sit down and we start revising the questions. But sometimes just taking it five minutes out, to say, what is the end result of this process? Like, what, what is the future state? What, what, what am I looking at at the end? What kind of student do I want first? And having that vision in mind, and then from there, it, because it helps us further down along the way when we want to break the frame, we want to change a, a certain type of question type that we're asking, a certain type of um, format that some people say, no, this doesn't seem like a fair format. Can we modify it? Our vision that we took the five minutes to create at the beginning can actually help us to make those decisions about, do we take out this form of questioning? We take it out if it does not bring us closer to the end of the hero's journey that we have envisioned at the very beginning. So the visioning is not just for the visioning is not just for you know big organizations or big you know strategic things. It's even for tiny things because it can take you know just maybe just two three minutes to just to just think about the whole story the whole way through. I think this is where I'm going. This is where I'm ending. And these are the things that I'm. These are the roadblocks I'm going to have along the way. And in terms of the support for students, it's yes, absolutely vital. The mentorship, so many ways of doing it. Um, a mentor bank, because I know like I'm part of them. Um, you know, the set, the 2004 graduating set were an absolute army. You know, if, if there was a mentorship bank, it's the kind of thing that you'd have people rushing to sign up, trying to finding ways to give back to the college I gave them so much. Um, so there are so many ways of doing it. Some of it can, the best way is actually that natural way, as Professor Hooper just said, you know, people who are aligned to you and aligned to the way you think. And sometimes if I just read from a lake where just for a fixed time, fixed purpose, um, calling on a reserve bank um, of people who, who can answer questions that are um, required. Um, then how do we support the mental model? Um, what else do we have? Yes, can we speak to, somebody asked, can you speak to the possibility of stories? not only as mirrors, but also as shapers. Yes, they, they, they actually shape what we see. So that's why it's important to see you know, the stories that we tell, the stories we take, the stories we believe, they actually do shape what we what we see. And I think that's the issue with the one minute clips on the TikTok and the, the, the still images on Instagram. It's very hard to tell a complete story in one. It, it's very hard to tell a complete story in one frame. And it's a very short format. So. I think just the way we develop more of an eye and more of an eye, if we see a picture and it's very alluring and we look at this picture and we see well, these people look like their lives are all perfect. And all we need to do is just think about, okay, where do we think they are on this journey? And straight away, you'll be able to begin to fill in the gaps of their story. You might be able to say, 
um, or oh, I think they're at the end, or I think they're just a setting out. And you can craft that story on their behalf in your mind, and then you're able to, and then you're able to, um, have a story that, 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 that helps you. Yep, so I think that's it on this. I've missed any questions. I think we've run past time. Maybe we'll pick them up in the next session. Yes, thank you so much. And I like that of the um, mentorship bank. Is that what you, I, I got it right, right? So having yeah. a, a bank of mentors from each of the classes, the people who have gone through the system to develop like, yes. How yes. people who are interested in mentoring. I think it's. I think the deputy provost is on this call, so I think we need to note that um, and think about it through because it's a, an excellent perspective. Like using our alumni as a mentorship bank for our students, yes. and then have, yes, for different issues. I think we need to think about that a bit more about how we can actually work it out. But I think it's an out an excellent idea. Deputy provost, are you there? Yeah, so that we don't, I don't forget, or oh, it's not, it's not, it's in there. I can see him online, but well, anyway. So I think it's a really, so I'm taking that away and I need to note it down. The issue of using our alumni in different parts and particularly now with the Zoom meetings and so many other things, I think it's a fantastic idea. So once again, I just want to thank you and ask them, that ask God to replenish you. We're so blessed and so grateful. Honestly, so much talent out there. And we're so proud that you are there, you know, fantastic, brilliant, using all your ideas and skills to really make a difference for us. So thank you and God bless. Thank you everyone who has joined us. See you again next week, same time with Buki Owosheni on to give us talk about the vision, having a vision. Thank you. Bye. 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 Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye.